The Appellate Division First Department is now in session. Welcome to our virtual oral argument. I will now call the calendar. The first case is Pupil versus Daniels, five and one for the appellant and five for the respondent. Uh, American Transit versus Martinez is submitted. American Transit versus Bay is submitted. Pupil versus Ole is submitted. White Rock versus Lloyd Syndicate is six and one for the appellant, six for the respondent. Uh, City of New York versus contract dispute. I understand uh, there's only one side here. Do you wish to submit? Uh, no, if your honor would permit, the city would still like to argue. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to give you three minutes then. Thank you, your honor. And if we need more time, we'll, we'll use that more time. Uh, Mayorkin versus Carriage House. Four and one for each of the three appellants and five for respondent. Uh, Tayagi versus Gadella is six and one for the appellant, six for the respondent. People versus Miles is submitted. People versus Perez is submitted. Caraz versus New York Presbyterian is submitted. Pearlberger versus Luton is five and one for the appellant and five for the respondent. People versus Alexandria James is submitted. Rising Sun versus Capgram Developer is six and one for the appellant, six for the respondent. Monroe Street versus City of New York is six and one uh, for the appellant and six and one for the respondent cross appellant. Uh, both Hutchinson versus Brown and Hutchinson versus Brown is submitted and Ostad Mafar is submitted. Council, please do not speak when a justice is speaking. This is especially important during oral argument, uh, which is held virtually. Please keep your microphones muted unless you are arguing. Uh, if you are on the screen, please make yourself aware that you're on the screen and don't do any behavior that would be inappropriate, such as speaking on the telephone or on the screen. Uh, thank you in advance for your cooperation. The first case being argued is People versus Daniels. Good afternoon and may it please the court. Olivia Green of Freshfields Brookhouse Deringer and in association with the Office of Appellate Defender, I represent Mr. Sean Daniels. The evidence does not show that Mr. Daniels caused the complainant's injuries or that he had a dangerous instrument. There is a grainy black and white video that shows the complainant fighting for over seven minutes with multiple people. Mr. Daniels participates for the first it's minute and then he leaves. The video does not show um, when or how the complainant receives his injuries. Ms. Ms. Green, this is Justice Moulton. Um, could the jury infer uh, uh, from the video that at one point the defendant did bring something across the neck of the victim, the complainant, and also that the complainant's uh, very comprehensive scarring uh, and, and the need for a lot of stitches, uh, those two facts together, are they not sufficient for the jury to find the defendant guilty? Your Honor, on the video, we see Mr. Daniels' arms swinging in the air, but we don't see anything in his hands. And um, we can't infer from that arm swinging that he is cutting the complainant because when we look at what's happening to him in context, he is off of the ground, he's being spun in a circle and body slammed to the ground. So he doesn't have full control over his body, you know, and he's taken by surprise and off balance. So in the video immediately after that particular part of the altercation, doesn't the complainant also then start to wrap a shirt around his neck or around his head? And could that give rise to an inference of bleeding? That's what he, and also I believe he testified to that. Your Honor, um, that does not occur immediately after that portion of the video. We see the complainant and Mr. Daniels fighting for about 15 seconds before other people join. And then we see another individual assaulting the complainant before we first see him begin to wipe something from his head. Um, and it's a black and white video. We can't see exactly what he is wiping, um, but there is another individual who assaults the complainant before we see any indication that he, you know, is wiping his head. And the complainant's testimony, you know, was in line with that. The complainant said he fought with Mr. Daniels and then other people soon joined. And then 
he felt himself bleeding for the first time. So this is this theory that at this moment, this first moment in the fight, Mr. Daniels um, was cutting the complainant. You know, we have to look at the video and consider all the things that we don't see in that moment. We don't see anything in Mr. Daniels' hands. The complainant was actually asked if he felt anything at that moment, and he specifically denied feeling anything at that moment. And we have to consider the fact that the full video of this fight shows the complainant fighting with multiple people um, over the seven minute period. And there are many instances where we can't see exactly what is happening, but we do see that other people are assaulting him and it raises a strong possibility that these injuries Counsel, are- this is Judge Gonzalez. I'm wondering if we saw the same video. So how do you explain the reaching over um, by the defendant when he's held up um, in the air by by the uh, the victim, and then the the motion that goes across the back of his head and elsewhere. Your Honor, what's happening at that time is he is being you know spun around by the complainant, and the so part that I'm you, talking about has no spinning. When he when the complainant comes out of the bar, he immediately charges at Mr. Daniels and they get into this fight. And it's clear when you're looking at the context of what's happening there that that Mr. Daniels doesn't have control and he doesn't have time to pull out an instrument or to use something. You know, he is you know not in a position where he can sort of carry out this act as the prosecution has charged. Um, and, you know, I, I really want to you know, focus on the fact that we don't see anything in his hands. Um, and we, we also uh, don't have any testimony from the complainant, who was the only person who was there at the fight, who came to testify at trial, that suggests that Mr. Daniels was the one who cut him. You know, he specifically denies feeling anything in that moment. And um, he also doesn't us say that he saw Mr. Daniels with anything. Thank you very much. You'll have time on rebuttal to respond. Uh, respondent. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Uh, may it please the court, Carl Dubel for the people. There is ample evidence at trial to prove that defendant was the person who caused his injuries. Chapman testified that after his initial struggle with defendant, he realized he was bleeding from his face and he had to take his pullover off and wrap it around his head to stop the bleeding. This testimony was completely supported by the surveillance video, which shows um, uh, Mr. Chapman rushing at the defendant. The defendant appears to fumble with something in his hands. He grabs uh, Chapman and then he slashes something across his face, whatever object he has in his hands. And they fall to the ground. And then once they get up, this is when Chapman is realized he's bleeding and that he uh, wraps the, the pullover around his head. This, we also know that this is exactly when the injury occurred because before the fight, there was nothing on the sidewalk. And then after the fight, you can see on the video that there's a liquid substance on the sidewalk. It, of course, the video is in black and white, so we're not 100% sure what that is based on the video. But then a few hours later, when the police get there, they take pictures of the sidewalk and you can see that it was in fact blood. Um, just to address a few of counsel's arguments, it's not possible that someone else in uh, some of the other people that punched Chapman caused these injuries. This type of injury was clearly caused by a slash wound and was not the force, uh, or was not caused by blunt force trauma. Well, counsel, kind of counsel, this is Judge saying, could it be possible that um, a another person in that melee, in fact, had the razor or knife or whatever it was uh, to to cut the uh, the victim? I think that's a very remote possibility, and the jury jury clearly didn't. And find and was that. that actually? And that's really the point that Judge Moulton was making. Those are issues really for uh, the jury, correct? I mean, I agree. This, this argument raised by defense counsel um, through the trial wasn't my client; might have been someone else. Uh, the jury heard that evidence, correct? And 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 made its determination. Exactly, Your Honor. I think you're exactly right. The we do see other people uh, punching the victim, but the only person who makes any type of slash motion 
um, is the defendant. So I think the jury was entirely correct in finding that that, that was exactly when the injury occurred. Um, unless there's any questions on the physical injury uh, element portion, um, we will rest on our brief. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appellant. Your honors, uh, to that point about whether this is an appropriate um, you know, question to raise on appeal, you know, what is unique about this case is that we have the main evidence is a video and this court can see the video just as the jury saw it. And this court can, you know, look at that to see if there is actually clear evidence Mr. Daniels committed this crime. Well, the video counsel, is inconclusive. Counsel, counsel, did anyone else um, use a slashing motion in, 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 in the altercation or was it only the defendant? I mean, that's, that's what, you're, uh, uh, that's what the, the people seem to suggest, that it was only the defendant who had the slashing motion. Your Honor, we don't see other people making that motion, but we also don't see so huge portions you, of you, this would fight. You, would you agree that there's a difference between a punching motion and a slashing motion? I would agree with that, but what and, we're arguing. And so coupled, I understand, I know I understand what you're arguing. So coupled with, with the testimony of the paramedic um, that, that, that there were serious cuts and, and based on the sequence of events of, of when um, the victim covered, attempted to, to, to staunch the bleeding, isn't that sufficient for the jury to make the determination as to whether or not it was the defendant who committed the act? Your Honor, the uh, paramedic wasn't there at the scene to see who could have inflicted these injuries. His testimony goes to the type of instrument that could have yeah, caused that's it. exactly right. It's consistent with a slashing or cutting, and the only person depicted doing the slashing was the defendant. We do not see significant portions of this fight, and so we can't say beyond a reasonable doubt that these injuries couldn't have been committed somehow you know outside of the view of the camera there are all these bystanders who are watching and they also do not appear to have seen mr daniels you know cut the complainant they are not showing any signs that they're afraid of him they're not co concerned about the complainant's condition which is notable because later thank on you. in the fight thank you very much do the justices have any more questions okay thank you very much thank you uh the next case is white rock versus lloyd's syndicate Thank you, Your Honor. Richard Mancino on behalf of White Rock Insurance Company in respect of the three cells that are the parties to the trust agreement in issue in this action and plaintiffs in the action below. The decision below should be reversed because White Rock's claim in this case was not actually decided in the previous arbitration. And the counsel, is, it's counsel, this is just saying, it's, it's hard for me to understand that argument but when I look to the arguments that were raised uh, before the arbitration, it seems to me that the arbitrators uh, at the invitation of the parties considered both the reinsurance contract um, and all the other sort of uh, uh, documents and contracts sort of went along with that dispute. Isn't that correct? Um, well, no, well, Your Honor, I would, I would say this in response to that question. That is, there was, there was testimony provided that talked about the trust agreement along with the, the reinsurance contract. But we have no evidence. And the, and the final award is the best evidence of what they decided. No evidence that the panel factored in any aspect of the trust agreement in their decision. They made no decision concerning the trust agreement. They mention it in, only once just to identify it as one of the suite of three as contracts. My, as my as, as Justice Singh just, just asked you, isn't it very clear that both sides were making the argument that the trust agreement did have an impact on the other agreement? And did, in fact, your client argue that because of the trust agreement, there was no obligation, which argument had to be had to rejected? Well, uh, Your Honor, uh, we, did, we did point to the trust agreement language as reinforcing our interpretation of the reinsurance contract. But we did not ask the panel to make any ruling on that. And in fact, the syndicate was adamant in telling the panel that the trust agreement was off limits in this. But, more, but the more important point, if I may, uh, I'm sorry, Justice. 
I, 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 I'm not sure I have the best team account. Everybody who's not speaking should be muted because we're having a lot of I, I, it just seems to me that 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 based on the arguments that were raised before the arbitration, the, the parties through their own conduct invited the arbitrators to consider all the documents in, in, in making a determination. I mean that that's really what it when when you parse through the arguments and the briefs, that's what it appears to be, no? Well, Your Honor, but the standard is not whether the arbitration panel may have heard evidence about or argument about uh, a trust agreement. It's whether or not, as reflected in the final award, they decided a claim under that contract, and they did not. Now, I'll also counsel, point out, Your Honor, that- Based on what the arbitrator actually did decide, isn't it clear that they did make a decision that the trust agreement did not preclude the syndicate from seeking to recover any debts of the cells that exceed the value of the assets maintained in the trust. Isn't that clearly part of the decision that was made? And didn't they have to construe the trust agreement to in fact make that decision? Uh, Your Honor, that is not the decision that they came to. What they came to was interpreting the reinsurance contract alone. They said the release of collateral does not correspondingly reduce the liability. They did not because they could not have answered the question, well, what happens later when after they ruled in our favor that there was no clawback right under this contract? So there was no mechanism for the syndicate to replenish the trust accounts, which are the sole source of recovery in this arrangement. They weren't confronted with that because that happened only as a result of their de their decision and their and, and our victory on that key uh, clawback issue, and then the and, and at the time of the arbitration, there was no claim for a specific monetor, monetary award. The syndicate had not tendered a claim for actual losses that were that were were not covered by funds in the trust. That only happened later. So coming back to the Sine source case and the Rembrandt decision by the Court of Appeals, where an issue or claim is not actually decided, even if the arbitrators consider it, you cannot give preclusive effect to that um, arbitration award as against a claim that's later asserted. And, and our claim is later asserted because the syndicate went into Guernsey to, uh, to say, we now have a loss. We want to get paid, but there's insufficient assets, funds in the trust account. So that's what the dispute, and that's what triggers the relevance now of the trust agreement and 14B. And I would also um, observe that the um, award itself cites only the reinsurance contracts to support their reasoning. Okay, so let's nothing. respond and then you'll have rebuttal. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon and may it please the court. John Finnegan for Respondent Syndicate 4242. Uh, picking up on, on what on Justice is saying in Kern's questions and an observation that, that Mr. Mancino said, I would agree with him that the final award is the best evidence of what the panel decided. And in that respect, I would say that there is four aspects of the panel's award that demonstrate that they decided the very issue that White Rock would like to relitigate now in New York Supreme. First, in the opening paragraph of their award, the panel wrote that it had carefully considered the briefs, exhibits, testimonies, and arguments submitted to it by the parties. The panel did not say that it was considering only some of the party's arguments, nor did the panel say that it was disregarding any of White Rock's arguments or cabining its analysis to the reinsurance contract. Rather, the panel assured the parties that it would consider all of their arguments, those based on the reinsurance contract, those based on the trust agreement, those based on industry custom and practice, and finally, those based in equity. Second, in paragraph two of its award, the panel framed the threshold issue before it broadly without reference to either contract. 
And it concluded that the issue was whether or not White Rock's liability was limited to the amount that then remained in trust. And, and, it, and, and it, you know, certainly White Rock's trust-based arguments fell clearly within that rubric. Then in no fewer than four places in its 12 page award, the panel stated that White Rock's arguments notwithstanding, White Rock remains liable for the full limits of liability as set out in the reinsurance contract. This appears in the record at pages 575, 582, 583, and 585. You know, the, the panel did far more than Mr. Mancino was prepared to concede. They said that the full limits of the reinsurance contract are unaffected. Third, as Justice Borak pointed out in his opinion below, the panel used the, uh, the, the, the excuse me, in paragraph 11 of, of their award, the panel began by talking about the agreement, and the agreement referred to the interest and liabilities agreement to the reinsurance contract. The panel then, uh, several sentences in, switched to using the lowercase term agreements plural. I disagree with Mr. Mancino that the panel did not consider the trust agreement. It most assuredly did, and it most assuredly made reference to the trust agreement in its award, just as Justice Burrick found. Uh, finally, even if the panel hadn't explicitly addressed any of the issues, the panel did what courts often do. At the very end of their opinion, they said, insofar as we haven't already addressed a party's requests, we, we deny them. So the panel did make certain, just as the court does, that it addressed everything all that the parties had to raise. Um, Mr. Mancino wants this court to believe that there wasn't any funds due and owing at the time of the arbitration agreement, uh, at the time of the arbitration. That's mistaken. If you look to pages, uh, and I apologize, pages 543 and 544 of the record, you'll see that at the time of closing arguments, $7 million was already due and owing. The only reason the syndicate didn't ask the panel to award that amount is because it hadn't been due and owing at the time the arbitration began, and there wasn't discovery on it because the amounts didn't become due and owing until October of 2019, uh, after discovery and the arbitration had closed. Um, uh, with that, I'm prepared to rely on the syndicate's brief, unless any of the court, any member, any of any the members of the court, any of the court. Do any of the justices have the justices questions? Have questions? Okay, thank you. Let's hear from yeah. appellant. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, uh, what's notable about uh, counsel for the syndicate's argument is that he can point you to no section of the final award in which the panel actually engaged with the language of the trust agreement. Indeed, but is that a, is that a requirement, counsel? Is that a requirement because it's sufficient that the arguments were raised? The, uh, yeah, uh, I'm the talking to the microphone. I, I apologize. I, so, but is that, isn't that sufficient? I mean, the arguments were raised. Why does the, uh, why does the panel have to specifically rule or analyze your arguments? Wouldn't it be sufficient to say that they considered the agreements and, and that, that they're denying the arguments? Well, Your Honor, but what they, what they ruled on is what was before the arbitration panel, which was the construction of the reinsurance contracts. It wasn't that what happened subsequent to that. I would also, if I may, just point out that, that you know, their catch-all argument, that, that a, a phrase at the end of a decision somehow is sufficient to capture a, a claim under a trust agreement, I mean, that would be uh, depriving an entity of due process, and it doesn't make arbitrable a claim that was not arbitrable. Thank you. Any further thank questions you. from the justices? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, our next case is City of New York versus Contract Dispute. Uh, good afternoon, Your Honors, and may it please the court. Philip Young here on behalf of the New York City Human Resources Administration. So New York Healthcare here doesn't dispute that HRA has just, just always- to cut, Just to cut it short, Council, your argument is basically the Court of Appeals has spoken. This is sort of an identical contract and, and we should do the same thing that happened uh, in the other case in terms of the, the Court of Appeals ruling. Is that the position? 
In a nutshell, that's right, Your Honor, with the caveat that the Court of Appeals and People Care didn't explicitly uh, address this annual audit issue, but the dissenting opinion of Justice Richter, which the Court of Appeals endorsed. And I, and I am fully aware of the dissenting opinion. <laughs> I understand, Your Honor. Very, very aware of it. <laughs> so thanks. <laughs> yes. So, so in Justice Richter's dissenting opinion, she uh, her her dissent strongly implies that um, that these types of annual audits are rational uh, because uh, you know the HRA has always had the authority to. Mr. Audit. Young, it seems like that this temporal argument is the last remaining argument that NYHC has. Um, they say that the city often honored this temporal limitation in the breach and often allowed um, for the disgorgement of funds after more than a year had transpired. You want to respond to that? Sure, Your Honor. So what they point to are basically is basically an instance where HRA asked the provider to retain funds for a little bit uh, as sort of a, a safety valve in case this Coke litigation um, turned out the wrong way and the providers were required to spend money on overtime expenses. Um, but the way that HRA treated uh, that litigation was entirely consistent with an annual auditing requirement where you can only spend money on expenses that are incurred in the year for which these HICRA funds were allocated. So what ended up happening is that the Supreme Court ruled uh, in the favor of the providers. And so the providers were not required to spend this extra money on overtime expenses. And so because of that, HRA properly declined to allow the providers to spend this money uh, in future years. And if the, the decision had come out the opposite way, what would have happened is that uh, providers would have used HICRA funds that they had received in you know, 2004 and 2005 to pay for overtime expenses that they incurred in the same year that those funds were allocated, 2004 or 2005. So it was always matching up the funds with the year of allocation. Um, and then the last um, note that the uh, that New York Healthcare points to on that issue is that um, at the very beginning, when these funds were appropriated in 2002, uh, HRA distributed some of these funds um, at the end of the fiscal year or right after the fiscal year. Um, but again, that's not inconsistent with this annual auditing requirement because the rule was that, you know, New York Healthcare and these types of providers could only spend those funds on expenses that they had incurred in that first year when these HICRA funds were appropriated. Okay, do the justices have any additional questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honors. Uh, the next case is Mayorkin versus Carriage House. I know there are three appellants in that case. Um, Good afternoon, Your Honor. Ed Guardaro for MNA, from an appellant. Uh, Your Honors, I want to bring to the court's attention the extreme prejudice, which is- I'm oh, sorry, are you representing all three appellants or just one of the appellants? I am just one of the appellants, MNA. Did you identify, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Did you identify which appellant you're representing? M and A. Okay. Go ahead. Your, Honor, I want to, Your Honors, I'd like to bring to the court's attention the extreme prejudice that befell the defendants, all of us, but especially M&A, from the court allowing an untimely motion for summary judgment. Uh, the plaintiff moved to vacate. The Counsel, is it true, though, that you, in fact, stipulated to vacating the note of issue, and based on the note of issue being vacated, the summary judgment motion was, in fact, timely? Your Honor, what happened was the plaintiff brought this up to Justice Gonzalez at the trial court. We vehemently objected. Justice Gonzalez told us she's going to grant the, the application, just sign an order, be done with it. So we followed the court's instruction. But, but counsel, counsel, couldn't it, couldn't you have protected yourself? Couldn't you have asked for a, a, a provision in there that uh, no motions for summary judgment if, if the um note of issues vacated, uh, but you left it essentially open-ended. Well, Your Honor, the, what we were confronted with, and again, the first time that we appeared in court, this came up, was an argument by the plaintiff that surgery was necessary. So we had, and, and the time for summary judgment had, had expired, you know, 18 months earlier. So this is Judge Owing, but that, that, that 
explanation of vacating the notice of issue having a rise out of the surgery of the plaintiff, that wasn't, uh, that wasn't fake, right? I mean, that was accurate. I mean, correct? I mean, there was no sort of uh, litigation gamesmanship going on, was there? Well, Your Honor, I would submit to the court there was. 20 days after this note of issue was, was vacated. No, you're saying that he didn't have a back surgery? There was no surgery at all? As I understand it, you know, close to a year later, there was a surgery. That, right, so, so, which, so, which, which the plaintiff's counsel bases his, his motion to vacate the note of issue. Yes, Your Honor, but if that were the case, then there's no need to, then there's no need to vacate the note of issue. You see, the, the, the you know, point... Do you want to spend your whole time arguing about the timeliness, or do you want to address the merits at all? Because you're rapidly running out of time. Thank you, Your Honor. I, I will move on. Your Honor, I'd also like to bring to the court's attention the fact that there's several issues of fact here under the circumstances. I would submit to the court that there's no proof of a prima facie showing of a violation, uh, you know, and there's no proof of a, of course, the hoisting issue and plaintiff jumps on that as being the only issue. That's not the only issue. The issue is also, of course, you know, pursuant to, to you know, Fabrizi and all the other cases, the need to be why secured. Isn't there, why isn't there a prima facie based on the brick falling down from a debris bag? which well, means Honor, it's not properly secured. Why is that not a prima facie case? Because that's a premise based on hearsay, number one, and the proof absolutely contradicts it. But, but isn't that, isn't that uh, a report a, a business record? Not based on a hearsay of, of, a, well, of a man well, who's never is that testified. Accurate? Is that accurate, counsel? Yes. I, yes. Are, yes. Is the issue, isn't the issue whether or not the, the person taking the report who is the principal uh, and and the uh, person giving the report, the foreman, are they under a business duty? I would submit to you that they are under a, a business duty to report accurately, correct? Because you're talking about people with supervisory um, authority. Your Honor, what we had in Buckley, and I think the court's referring to Buckley, was Mr. White, who actually submitted an affidavit. There's, there was something other than his statement. And here we have nothing. We have zero. We don't have a deposition. We don't have an you're affidavit. Have, thank you. You're going to have rebuttal time. So let's hear from the next appellant now. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Andrew Kolowitz for Appellant Carriage House Owners Corp. So I'll sort of, if it's okay, kind of pick up where my colleague left off. And I, I just like to point out a couple things in the record and why really there are questions of fact here. To Your Honor's point and my colleague's point, nobody made any effort to depose this individual named Gabriel. And purportedly, he was the one who gave this information to Mr. Martinez, who drafted the accident report. But the interesting thing is when Mr. Martinez testifies, he testifies that Gabriel told him that the plaintiff was standing under the sidewalk bridge, not on top of the sidewalk bridge. Anybody could have went out and taken Gabriel's deposition, including the plaintiff. They didn't serve a subpoena or make any effort to depose Gabriel. We don't know where Gabriel was, wait a where second. he was Are standing. You, wait, wait, this is Judge Owen. I have a question. You made a motion for summary judgment, correct? No, the plaintiff made the motion for summary judgment. Okay. But you're saying anybody could have taken that deposition. Why didn't you? Well, we didn't You're trying to raise we, an issue of fact. You just want to raise an issue of fact. So a deposition would have helped you, right? I mean, if you knew that this was going to probably be going to be a focus of the litigation. That's speculative. We don't know what he'd say. And I, I will say this. Well, you though. just told me that you just said to us that this guy is like key. I mean, from what I get, maybe I heard wrong, but it sounds like you said all the buzzwords that seems like this guy is essential to either thumbs up or thumbs down the case. So when you said nobody took his deposition, Okay, plaintiff didn't take the deposition, but that doesn't mean you can't take the deposition. He's nobody. totally correct. You're totally right. correct, Your Honor. Okay. I mean, there's an absence of a key witness's testimony here, and there's a lot of ambiguity in the record. You know, you 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 ask plaintiff, and if I could show you uh, in the record, and I'm reading from 157, was anybody working on the scaffolding directly above you at the time of the accident? He responds, no. What kind of renovation work, was there any kind of a renovation work going on anywhere else at the building that you could see at the time of your accident? Page 158 of the record, no. Later on, he, he's asked, did you ever see anybody working on the scaffolding in the hour before the accident? 
No. The point being is it's totally not clear. The plaintiff doesn't know where this debris came from. Gabriel, who supposedly was- Are you, are you suggesting that the debris council didn't come from above, that the debris bag didn't break open as the incident report suggests? We is don't know. Suggesting? You don't know. We don't know. We don't know. So, so the, the question is, so the question is, is did the plaintiff make a prima facie? And I, I assume you argue, no, they didn't make a prima facie. Uh, let's assume for argument's sake, prima facie was made. How have you raised an issue of fact? Well, I, I, I think enough is there in the record where you have conflicting testimony, conflicting testimony as to how this hazard or dangerous situation came about. You have, again, Mr. Martinez, who testifies a couple different things. And here's the employer of the plant. But Mr. Martinez, Mr. Martinez wasn't at the site, right? He was, the, he was the president of the company and the project manager. That's but really, correct. he was testifying as to what Gabriel told him. That's, that's correct, but he testified also in his personal knowledge that plaintiff had no business being up on that scaffold, that I, sidewalk that, that's, scaffold. That's, wouldn't that just be comparative fault anyway? If well, he wasn't supposed to be in the scaffold, wouldn't that just be, which would not be enough to uh, defeat summary judgment on a labor law case? Well, I think there's a little bit more to it. On, on, on 240, I'm not sure you get the comparative fault if there's summary judgment, but yeah, you do. Uh, if it's just comparative, you do get summary judgment under the law. That's that's understood. But 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 Mr. Martinez testifies that he and others explicitly told the plaintiff not to use the uh, sidewalk scaffold, not to stand on top of it, not to be okay, on top I'm, of it. I'm going to let Advance finish up your argument for you, and you each get a minute of rebuttal. So why don't we hear from Advance? Thank you, Your Honor. Um. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Um, I think I'm going to go back a little bit to the timeliness issue here. I think that's the main issue on this appeal. It's fairness, simple fairness. Is it a fair to allow a plaintiff to unilaterally go to a court and say, hey, my client is having surgery, so I want to withdraw the note of issue that I filed two years earlier and then go around and 20 days later file a liability summary judgment motion? When practically in every other case, when post note of issue treatment is brought up by a plaintiff, what happens? The court simply but, allows. But, but counsel, the once the note of issue is vacated, then it, it's 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 at it's at its pre-note uh, stage at that point. And, well, and it seems to me that 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 you had perfectly competent lawyers present in court on that date when you appeared for jury selection, who could have said, "Judge, if you're doing this, don't give him a second bite at the apple and let him refile a motion for summary judgment." You didn't do that. Well, this was something that plaintiff. Threw out of nowhere, they were ready to pick a try a jury at this point. They were literally there to pick a jury. And plaintiff comes up and says, "Hey, I want to vacate because I have this uh, more treatment." There was nothing there that says, "Oh, hey, let's make a motion to allow this to happen for us to address the issues." The court didn't allow any of that. It didn't take any of the arguments by defendants under consideration. It just says, "This is my ruling. Sign the stipulation, and that's it." There was no basis, nothing to. You know, Wait, was it a stipulation? Was it a stipulation or was it an order? Wasn't it a stipulation that you signed? It was so ordered, I believe. Well, but it's a stipulate, a so ordered stipulation. It's 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 you, you consented to the relief being sought, in other words. You didn't have to consent to it. From my understanding, and I, I was in counsel at the time, from my understanding, there was no uh, ability to not consent to it. The court simply said, Hey, here's the order, please. Um I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, here's the order. Sign it. Go and sign it. And didn't take any of the arguments by the parties there. It didn't well, wait allow a second. Them. This is Judge Owing. I got it. You know, it's an order. For whatever it's worth, it's an order that vacated the note of issue. You should have taken an appeal, immediately appeal. You could immediately appeal the, th the thing to the first department instead of waiting now for it. If that was a problem. You, do, you couldn't do that? In hindsight, probably could have been done. Ah, so now you're saying after the, okay. Uh, well, okay. Okay, let's hear from uh, a oh, respondent. I'm sorry, if I could just address, if I have a minute, the 240. Go ahead. The merits, um, I believe I still have a minute left. Just in terms of the issue of fact, there is here the record itself has an issue of fact by plaintiff's own testimony. Regardless of whether the court accepts that record of the accident report, Plaintiff testified that when he was working there, there was no work taking place above him on the facade from those hanging scaffolds. 
So that, together with the fact that there was no testimony from those alleged people in that incident report, creates the issue of fact. Well, counsel, this is Judge Gonzalez. Could you uh, discuss briefly, um, if, if you can, Augustin versus City, which is a 2012 case where the court decided, the first department decided that whether the person, that that plaintiff was on top of the canopy or on top of a sidewalk bridge, it was immaterial under either version that the, that the, it was inter, it, it was immaterial because the lack of adequate protection, the lack of an adequate protective device is what caused the injuries. Isn't that the crux of this whole case, the lack of protection? of a protective device. There was netting, but obviously, it, well, it appears to be, um, have been quite inadequate. Well, that's the issue here. Was it inadequate? Plaintiff says that nothing fell from the hanging scaffold because there was no work on those hanging scaffolds. And then we have this incident report that- wait, 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 Counsel, you're saying that no brick fell according to the plaintiff? He said he saw the brick next to him when when he opens his eyes. Yeah, but, but, but more than that, counsel, counsel I, I'm sorry, I, I don't understand how, how, where are you getting that from? As I understand, plaintiff was working on the bridge, felt an impact of a brick on his head, and then saw the brick on the floor of the sidewalk bridge uh, before losing consciousness. Why is that not sufficient? Just based on the plaintiff's testimony that he was struck by an unsecured brick from above. We don't know where that brick came from. Yes, we have this incident report, but the incident report doesn't isn't conclusive because he says com contradictory to that incident report. He's saying there's no work above him. The incident report says that that's where the big brick came from. So it can't be both. And okay. that is just let's, an issue of fact. Thank, one thank of you, so let's hear from respondent now. You each have a minute for rebuttal afterward. Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the court. This is John Shaw for plaintiff respondent. In 20 seconds, with respect to the stipulation, there was no ill will here. The defendant signed the stipulation. All parties signed the stipulation, and they misspoke. Uh, we were waiting for approval from COMP for the surgery. Uh, two months later, COMP approved it in January. And then in February, not one year later, as counsel misstated the record, the surgery took place. Thereafter, um, they had subsequent depositions and a further physical. And then when we put the count, the case back on the calendar, they moved to strike, uh, the note of issue. Um, and even if my client did not have surgery, hypothetically, the note was vacated. Um, uh, and as a matter of law, the clock starts ticking. So there's no basis uh, to say the motion was on time. Okay, counsel, can you address uh, the uh, why you why you believe there is no issue of fact? Because there, according to your adversaries, appears to be some inconsistent inconsistency in the record with respect to what the plaintiff testified and what the incident report says. Uh, certainly, Your Honor. Um, first of all, uh, counsel misspoke about uh, Mike about. Mr. Martinez or someone uh, warning my client not to uh, stand above the sidewalk bridge. There's absolutely nothing in the record where my client was warned. And hypothetically, under the Hill case, if my client was warned to not work above, even though there's nothing in the record to say so, uh, a mere instruction to avoid a certain practice, as your honors even pointed out, and most goes com to comparative negligence. In the Hill case, the plaintiff was actually warned not to work in that barricaded area, but there was no protection. And, the, and this court said, it does not matter that an instruction is not uh, a safety device. And in this case, my client testified that- Well, could instruction, terminated. failure to follow an instruction go to sole proximate cause, maybe? Uh, no, it does not. When there's no protection, as in the Hill case, in this case, my client testified, which was uncontroverted. Um, it's in the record, I think 175 and 176 of the record. There was no overhead protection and no netting. There was nothing in the record to controvert 
that my client was given any overhead protection because there was none. So that was in of itself a violation of labor law section 240 so one. He could not be the sole proximate cause and no one ever directed him not to work in that area. And with respect to the brick, as your honor pointed out, just on my client's testimony alone, that's a prima facie case, a, a brick, fell from above. My client felt the impact. He was bleeding. He saw the brick right next to him on the sidewalk bridge after the impact. The ambulance came and they took him. And even Mr. Martinez, who was not at the scene at the time of the accident came, he said he saw the plaintiff bleeding and he was carried off in a stretcher. That establishes a 240 cell one prima facie case, the proof goes to them. And with respect to this accident report, uh, of course, uh, Mr. Ortega, the foreman, had a business duty to report it to uh, Mr. Martinez. He was the supervisor. He was the foreman. In fact, that's a, another misstatement. Of course, he had personal knowledge. Uh, he was the one uh, working with a coworker at the time who lost control of the debris or the debris bag, which was the object that was supposed Excuse to- Excuse me, if you're not speaking, brick. please mute the microphone. Uh, that brick fell, it was, to quote Mr. Martinez, it was a rain of debris. The, the, the brick from above fell and struck my client. There's no dispute. And under the Buckley case and um, the I think matter of Leon case, the railroad case. Of course, uh, Mr. Ortega as the foreman had a business duty and they never even raised it in the lower court papers. Their whole argument was it was hearsay. They, they conceded that it was uh, that Mr. Ortega had a business duty. Now in their uh, appellate papers, they're saying, oh, he did not have a business duty. That's an argument raised for the first time on appeal. And of course he had a business duty okay. and even more so. Thank Counsel, thank you very much. Thank By you. the way, my comment about muting was not directed towards the judge, it was directed towards the attorneys. So just, just to let you know, the judges don't have to stay muted because I know that's difficult. Uh, okay, M&A, you have one minute. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I'd like to just address some of the questions that the, the court was asking. Justice Owing, I'm not really sure that a a, a motion to strike a uh, strike a note of issue is an appealable order, but that's either here or there. We did not appeal that, so that that point. Uh, the, another justice asked, uh, you know, why didn't we depose Gabriel? Well. By the time we realized what was happening, 20 days after the striking of the note of issue, plaintiff had already made a motion for summary judgment. And as you notice, we didn't make a motion for summary judgment because we well, thought- How long was the action pending on the on the uh, calendar uh, before the first note of issue was filed? Uh, it was a couple of years, Your Honor. Okay, so wasn't there enough time? It's not as if- uh, No, no, no. It's, it's not a situation you didn't know who uh, Mr. Ortega was because his name, uh, right? I mean, it's something that that that- was pretty easily ascertainable, no? Yeah, yes, Your Honor, I'm not arguing that we didn't have time, I'm not. I'm, I'm simply saying that that was not the defense strategy at the time, because while it came up at the deposition, and we, we proposed it at the deposition, we asked questions about it, we realized that it was, inadmissible. we thought it was inadmissible for the plaintiff. The plaintiff had never moved for summary judgment, so so we let it go. Okay, um, let's hear from Carriage House now, thank you. Uh, Your Honors, I, I just want to point out a couple things of the record in the record with respect to Mr. Martinez's testimony, and I believe Justice Singh raised an issue as to whether or not um, there could be a sole proximate cause defense here, or, or enough so that it should go to the jury. And I'm reading from page 560 of the record. Before the day of the accident, did you ever advise the MoDu employees not to perform any work below the hanging scaffold? Yes. He's last later on. And did you ever tell them this at the office? Did you tell them this on site? He responds on site. He goes on to say that this was a regular instruction to the employees. He also testifies on page 557 of the record. There was no work for him to do above the canopy. This is where Mr. You know, Mayor Quinn claims he was standing at the time. So I submit to you, your honors, that this question should perhaps go to a jury that there's enough here in the record that- Counsel, I'm so at a loss. You're, aren't, aren't we going back to the issue of comparative negligence, which is not 
a defense under 241? Isn't the issue whether or not there was a lack of a protective device? And isn't the isn't that issue definitive here that there was not? Your Honor, I, I, I don't believe so. I don't believe so that it's definitive because there is, again, ambiguity in the record as we walk through the record. As, as to, to where the brick came from? As to where the brick came from, where Mr. Mayor Quinn was at the time, whether or not he should have been on that scaffold above the sidewalk. You keep going but, back to that issue and it, perhaps it's not the proper focus let's, here. Let's hear from advanced. I have one minute. Okay, just a simple uh, response to plaintiff's counsel says that there was no ill will when they went to the court to vacate the note of issue. But I think the timeline itself shows that that's probably not true. For them to go to the court, ask to vacate it, and 20 days later, literally 20 days to file a summary judgment motion that they could have filed two years earlier when another party actually did in fact file a summary judgment motion and get out of the case two years earlier within the appropriate deadline and there's nothing new that happened in terms of liability all the evidence he relied on was the same evidence that was available two years ago so that's just in terms of like them saying there's no ill will I think it's pretty clear that they got this vacated in order to file this motion when they realized, oh, wow, we forgot to file a motion. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Um, the next case is Tayagi versus Godella, and Justice Moulton is disqualified on that matter. It may it please the court. I'm Barbara Goldberg. I represent the defendants appellants. I would like to focus first on the allegation that an overdose of the medication propofol was administered to the plaintiff during the surgery. It's very important to emphasize that all of the contemporaneous documentation that was created at the time of the surgery indicates that only a 10 milligram bolus of propofol was given. This is in the anesthesia record, which is at page A1312. It's hard to see, but it's there. In Council, addition, why isn't the there a factual issue making this case inappropriate for summary judgment based on the fact that propofol, pro, I can't pronounce it, was issued and the, the patient had allegedly had the reaction it had, which was a severe reaction and not the appropriate reaction, and the expert opined as to that. Why isn't that enough to create a factual issue? Um, Your Honor, the expert said that it was medically impossible, quote unquote, a 10 milligram bolus to have caused an episode of respiratory arrest and speculated on that basis that there must have been an overdose. But the well, reason- Well, oh, counsel, counsel, this is Judge Singh. Counsel, this is Judge Singh. If 10 milligrams, uh, if only 10 milligrams were administered, how would, how would the plaintiff have gone into uh, respiratory uh, depression? Because, Your Honor, both Dr. Gadala the attending anesthesiologist, and Dr. Eisencraft, the defendant's expert anesthesiologist, indicated that there can be a sensitivity to medication. Okay, fair enough. I, I, I saw that argument, and I guess my, my question then is, is how long had the plaintiff been under anesthesia uh, when, 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 when she was given that, uh, uh, that additional dosage, whatever the number is, and, and why didn't she suffer some respiratory distress in, in the time she was in anesthesia before? So aren't these all by illustration issues for the jury to consider based on the reasoned arguments of the, of the parties at trial? Well, the answer to that, Your Honor, is that during the time that she was under anesthesia, she had been getting the equivalent of 10 milligrams of propofol approximately every three minutes. But at the point when this additional bolus was administered. At that point, the dosage was essentially doubled, and that was the point at which her blood saturation levels began to decrease. So that is completely consistent with there being an unforeseen sensitivity to the medication. Dr. Gadala specifically testified that it is dose-related, whether a patient has a response to anesthesia medications is quote unquote dose related. That's at page 684. But what I also think is very telling is that plaintiff's expert just said, well, it had to be an overdose. But plaintiff's expert never said 
what would constitute an overdose, how much in excess of 10 milligrams would constitute an overdose, or what amount of propofol in excess of the existing infusion. But, but what does it matter? In this instance, we know there was, we know she went into respiratory distress. So, so maybe there was, she was given more than 10 milligrams, maybe it was 11 or 12 or 15, or maybe it was 10 and it was sensitivity. And, 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 and again, those are questions for the jury. Your Honor, I would respectfully submit that without the expert having indicated what would represent an overdose, there is no issue of fact here that it's pure speculation. Well, it must have been an overdose. And there is no other than the so, counsel. Isn't it just as equally pure speculation that it was a sensitivity that caused it? I mean, you keep saying it's a sensitivity, but it could equally be a sensitivity or an overdose. How could we, as a court, make that determination which one caused her distress? Because the only contemporaneous evidence is that a 10 milligram bolus of propofol was given. And that's, as I said, that's in the in the contemporaneous record. Uh, it was also corroborated by the resident, Dr. Grivarianis, in her affidavit. She said that, uh, I admit it was submitted in reply, but she said that after the incident, she looked at the bolus syringe and the propofol was only decreased by 10 milligrams. That's at page 1993 of the record. So the only contemporaneous evidence is that 10 milligrams was administered when, according to Dr. Gadala, Dr. Grivarianis perceived that the patient was moving on the operating table. It was close to the end of the procedure. The surgeon was closing the incision. According to what Dr. Grivarianis told Dr. Gadala, she thought the patient moved, so she gave an additional 10 milligrams of propofol, which, by the way, Dr. Gadala said was perfectly appropriate if she thought that the patient moved. So we have the only contemporaneous documentation being 10 milligrams. We have evidence. You know, I think your argument would be a lot stronger, but for the fact that the plaintiff went into, into severe respiratory depression. You know, I, that's, that's, I'm sort of having a problem with that part, that second aspect of it to, to really accept the argument that as a matter of law, it was sensitivity and not anything else. But again, there can be, we, we, we know from common experience that people can have very extreme allergic reactions to certain substances. We hear about people having seafood allergies. We hear about people having peanut allergies. People can have extreme and untoward reactions to what would apparently be an innocuous substance. And the Thank fact you, counsel. Thank you. Your time is up. We're going to hear from uh, respondents and you'll have a rebuttal time. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Good afternoon, may it please the court. My name is Matt Geyer of Kramer Dilloff, Livingston and Moore, and I represent the plaintiff's respondents. Your honors, there are so many questions of fact on this record on appeal. The first one being, what was the cause of the respiratory arrest? And let's make clear, by the way, this is a respiratory arrest, not simply a desaturation, an episode of desaturation. It's a medical emergency respiratory arrest. That's why there was an emergent intubation here and it's life-threatening. And the question is what caused it? There's no question that it's the propofol. But, 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 but counsel, your adversary's point is in the evidence, all we have in the record was that 10 milligrams were given. And, and, and is it speculation to say that, 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 it, that um, the dosage was more than 10 milligrams? No, it's not speculation. Here's why. Uh, uh, the, only, the only evidence that they can say as to why it isn't 10 milligrams is to explain why she would have had respiratory arrest after having received it is that there was a, a sensitivity, an unforeseen sensitivity. And if you look, frankly, there's not even a, any opinion with any degree of certainty that, sh that that's what happened here. Dr. Dr. Gadella simply said uh, she suspects it was a sensitivity and her expert, Dr. Eisencraft, said it may have been. Uh, however, the reason that they can't even give a definitive opinion is because for 90 minutes, she's getting infusions of propofol without any sensitivity whatsoever. Dr. Well, but, but, but isn't there a buildup and then finally it's like the, you know, the, the, the straw that broke the camel's back kind of thing? So, okay, if there was a buildup and if she was sensitive, there would be signs of sensitivity. There are no signs of sensitivity and it doesn't just build up, by the way. Council talked about a, a dosage doubling. There's no expert testimony about that because that's not what happens. It wears off. Propofol, if you ever had it, you get it. It's on, a, it's on a drip, it wears off, okay? So there's not a doubling. It's it, Our expert said 
three mil, uh, milligrams every ten every three minutes at uh, ten milligrams rather sorry every three minutes. So it's com it's coming in, it's going. So if she was having any sensitivity to propofol, there would be signs of it. So then everybody agrees 10 milligrams is a really small dose. Everybody said that. So then at this point, she gives the bolus and then suddenly she's in respiratory arrest. That makes no sense. The, the only thing that's speculation here is that there was a sensitivity. The far more logical conclusion from the circumstantial evidence is that uh, it was far more than the 10 milligrams. And we don't have, our expert can't possibly say how much more because you can't calculate what it would take to institute respiratory arrest. But you can say without sensitivity, getting 10 milligrams every three minutes, then a 10 milligram uh, bolus is not going to send you into respiratory arrest. And that's what he said. So we clearly have an issue of fact there. But we have other also important issues of fact with regard to the monitoring and the even more important, uh, uh, the, re the resuscitation efforts. We and we have really uh, the best I'm evidence. Why don't you world. bring that up, Council? Because I don't. That doesn't really seem to be part of what's on appeal. Since there's no cross appeal, the only thing that's being appealed um, is the propofol, not not the other claims. So there was no cross appeal from the original decision, but then on re-argument, they they reinstated the propofol and clarified this issue and now no I, new decision I'm, I'm arguing your case there was no I, new decision on that so we, we shouldn't be addressing it so well if the court doesn't feel we need to address it then i don't feel we need to address it either either that, I, your so, argument that we don't need to address it though because it's not appropriately before us because the only thing on appeal is what changed in the subsequent decision not okay so i pointed out to the court that they never cross appealed originally okay the problem is they have raised it, so therefore I've covered it. I don't think that it was no, probably- my question is in your position that it's inappropriate for us to consider it. Any arguments having to do with the third and fourth claim? I, 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 don't, I, I don't feel comfortable going that far in all honesty, Judge. Okay. Uh, I, I, I think on the merits though, I'm so solid that I really don't care. Uh, uh, I mean, I've got the best evidence in the world, you know, when, it, when, it, when medical defendants, when they create uh, medical records, rather, when doctors create medical records, that's their creation. We have objective data in the metadata that comes from the anesthesia monitoring equipment recorded by a computer. When Dr. Gadala wrote her notes after the incident, she wasn't contemplating what was in that metadata. That metadata proves that there was eight and a half minutes of hypoxia. It proves that there was seven and a half minutes of what she described as dangerously abnormal oxygen levels, down below 70%. Now she claimed that below 70 is, 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 is the, the monitor is, the, the readings are inaccurate, but she said, but they're still below 70. That went off for seven and a half minutes before this woman was intubated. Uh, our expert explained that you have to immediately turn her over, put a mask on her, if it doesn't work, intubate right away. They clearly didn't do that. And then uh, 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 you have a huge issue about when the intubation happened. They claim it was 9.45. The metadata proves that's impossible. She wrote 9.45 after the incident, but the metadata proves that she was still uh, dangerously abnormal oxygen at, 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 nine, at 9.47.15. It was listed as 12.5. Even if that's only 70, that's still dangerously abnormal. That's seven and a half minutes at least of, of that going on. And clearly she couldn't have been intubated at 9.45. In fact, she admitted uh, that, there, and, and the metadata proves no carbon dioxide levels in the until 9.47.15. That's two minutes and 15 seconds after 9.45. And she said, you don't have intubation without carbon dioxide levels. So she was asked okay, in her you. deposition. Council, thank you very much. Uh, let's hear from Appellant, you have one minute. Thank you. Uh, yes, yes, Your Honor. Um, I want to point out that the reason we addressed the monitoring and um, the resuscitation in our brief was that in the original order as to which the plaintiff sought re-argument, the justice below, uh, the, the Supreme Court denied summary judgment as to an issue of failing to take arterial blood gases. And on its face, a failure to take arterial blood gases is not the same as a failure to monitor. And I would also like to point out um, that essentially what occurred here is consistent with what the plaintiff's expert said should have been done to apply mass ventilation for only the amount of time necessary to see the patient's response. Well, you know, even though your opposing counsel was not willing to make the argument, and I'm not sure why, 
I, I'm not sure why we would be addressing claims three and four because there was no re-argument on that. There was only a clarification. So I don't I don't know why that's properly before us to even consider claims three and four as opposed to the propofol claim. Propofol. I, get, getting back very quickly to the propofol, uh, pl plaintiff conceded in uh, their brief on page 58 that it was either the an overdose, which I maintain that the record does not support, or the unforeseen sensitivity. And I maintain that the only evidence in this case that is credible evidence as to the cause of the episode, whether you call it desaturation or whether you call it a respiratory arrest, the only credible evidence is that it was an unforeseen reaction because there is just no contemporary evidence of okay. anything more than 10 milligrams having been given. Thank you very much. Um, the next case is Pearl versus Luton. Um, good afternoon. I'm Gary Luton, appearing for myself as appellant. Um, I have no prepared speech, but wanted to be available to answer any questions the court may have and to address any issues raised by a respondent. Does uh, do justices have any questions? There are no questions. Um, so, <laughs> well, may I, may I then reserve the rest of my time allocation for rebuttal to address issues raised by a respondent? Sure. Thank you. Respondent. Thank you. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Vernon in Ginsburg by Yoram Salagi for the plaintiff. Um, I don't really have. Um, I will just answer any questions the court may have regarding the issues raised by appellant. I don't have anything to add that's not. I, I counsel, I, I have a question of you. Why, sure. why, is, why is the appellant incorrect in his assertion that there was uh, a settlement here? Uh, uh, that, go ahead. Your Honor, uh, he has not provided uh, one shred of evidence of any type of settlement that was done after the judgment was is, was issued. If any court would would buy an argument that when a when a motion to renew a judgment for 20 years is made, that the opposing party could just make a blatant assertion that the case was settled, then none of these motions would ever be granted, Your Honor. So now, is, now, in in the uh, the judgment here originally was 2001, I think. Were yeah, there yeah. settlement? Well, excuse me. Were there uh, judgment enforcement activities uh, in the last 20 years? Uh, my client gave the gave the uh, judgment to a debt collector to try to enforce, but Mr. Luton has has not honored the debt and has tried to, through any way, manner, shape, and form, not to pay this debt and 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 instead try to litigate this, oh, in my op humble opinion, over litigate this in court instead. Are there any further questions from the justices? OK, uh, do you want to respond, uh, Mr. Luton? You're muted. My apologies. Can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry. Um, well, as far as evidence of settlement is concerned, um, I tried to provide what um, facts I could to show the obvious logic of its having been settled um, in responding to the action. Do you have any evidence other than your mere assertion, though, that there's been a settlement? Well, I tried to provide the logic for it, but as I was indicating, I only had a few days to respond and I didn't have immediate access to fax records. But, but also, but, but Mr. Luton, this this is sort of what I was trying to tease out from the questioning of uh, Mr. Salagi, is that if there was a settlement, over the years there have been efforts to collect the debt. I don't know, but if I were the judgment debtor, I'd be running up and down, jumping and going into court saying this case has been settled. The information subpoenas or restraining notices, they're all invalid. And it's, it, it, but but nothing like that happened in this case. So 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 the it's it's inconsistent with your position of a settlement. Well, no, in fact, what, what did happen is each time he um, initiated efforts, 
I told the lawyer, and this was in the um, affidavit I submitted, I suggested that the lawyer who had been engaged examine the records and they immediately dropped the case. So I assume they did go back to the civil court and found the um, settlement. That so it's your position that there's a there's a record in civil court settling the case? Well, I would hope so. Mr. Perlberger told me he had submitted it. OK, well, then maybe maybe you should have gone to civil court to to get it. Well, I, I would have if it had proceeded and we hadn't had a pandemic and the judge had, you know, the, the what I understood and this may have been incorrect, but what I understood was given the short time frame that I needed to present sufficient um, statements under um, sworn testimony to provide what information I could in a you know few days allowed time and that I would then have an opportunity for the court to address the factual issues. That may have been sloppy or inadequate, but that had been my understanding. I don't think there's any um, conceivable logic to explain um, any alternative theory of this to be, I mean, again, I know that may not be legally supportable, but I think I provided enough information to make it clear that the, um, you know, that there had been a settlement. There wasn't any logical explanation for an alternative theory. Um, you know, I'd point out that the only response Perlberger made in his reply, um, and I'll. Counsel, I mean, um, Mr. Luton, if I may, um, did you pay any money pursuant to that settlement? No, never. Um, Mr. Perlberger, you know, there, there was clear evidence that, that he had um, um, not performed adequate legal services, which exposed him to a very significant liability. Absolutely. He, got a, he already got a judgment, so those questions, those those issues are precluded because that was the argument you made, and in response to those arguments, he won a judgment. So can't make those arguments again. No, no, I, no, I'm not trying to re-argue it. I'm just saying that what I could have done um, 20 years ago was number one, appeal the case, and number two, I could have sued him for malpractice. Right, but you did neither nor. Okay, any further questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. The next case is Rising Sun versus Cab Graham Developer. If it pleases the court, Joseph Zomanowitz of Stone Zomanowitz representing the uh, defendant appellants. Uh, in 2016, uh, the plaintiff entered into a subcontract with Cabram Developer, one of the defendants here, to install stone panels for a Gramercy Square development project that consists of four to five buildings in Gramercy Square. The defendants paid over $2 million on a $2.5 million subcontract, but after two years, defendants got nowhere. There wasn't any stone panels that were on, and nothing could be done, and nothing was accepted, and nothing was received except change order after change order and threatened walk off. So after two years in October 2018, after all this money was spent and nothing received yeah, so for we're it. We're familiar with the facts. We've, we've reviewed everything. We've reviewed the briefs. Let, so let's get let's get to the real issues in this case. This is allegation that there's a second agreement that's separate and apart from the first agreement, which allows you to do, to do certain things. But doesn't the first agreement specifically say that there has to be uh, any changes in it should be done via modification. So even if there was some subsequent agreement, wouldn't that just be a modification? In which case, all the original provisions, including the provision bar and consequential damages, would still be in play. I, I respectfully disagree, Your Honor, because this second contract of October 2018 was. Very I, I, I'm sorry, Counsel. Well, what is the second contract? I, I, I don't. I don't. I'm looking through the record. I haven't seen a second contract. What, what, which, what, what am I missing? That's a good question. And the reason for that is. Uh, it's like the last case. There's a settlement. And I haven't seen well, the settlement. Well, I have it in my I hand. Seen... Judge, I have it in my hand. It was produced twice or even more. It's a little uh, bit too little not... too late to say you have it... it in your hand now, counsel. We can only decide cases on the record. We don't have any record before us. We're, we can't read it from your screen. Understood, oh, but it's a motion to dismiss. And that's what it was. The pleading alleged all the terms of this contract. But it's, it's documentary evidence. You can't say there's an agreement 
and then not produce an agreement. It, 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 an agreement either does or does not exist a written agreement. Well, we alleged that it did exist. That was in the uh, counterclaims that we alleged. The only time it came up that it was an oral uh, contract was in one word. Hey, Counselor, this is Judge Owen. I'm going to humor you. When did you get that written agreement that you just flashed in the screen? When did you get that? Oh, this was a uh, this was produced in the case. This but, was, when uh, was it produced in the case? Before yeah. the motion to dismiss was made. Uh, around the same time or yeah, after. So why did you include it in the Why well, did you include it in the opposition papers? Well, pro uh, if I think back That's to now, Judge Judge Oing, it yeah, was. Yeah. It was something that was uh, produced afterwards, and it and it, and many documents. And, 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 and counsel, million to, dollar construction. Counsel, I'm sorry. This is Judge Singh. Uh, to Judge uh, Kern's point, maybe it wasn't produced because it's really a modification of 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 the first contract of some kind. So it's really under the auspices of the first contract what the parties agreed to do in October 2018. No. Well, again, I respectfully disagree because there's no dispute about what the terms of this subsequent agreement, call it what you want, oral, not oral. There was an agreement in October 2018. It happened to have been not fancy, signed by all the parties, all the principals, and they said, look, nothing is getting done. This so is what we want. So the crisis sounds that the, you're telling us it was a written agreement. We've had all this motion practice. We have an appeal, and that written agreement was never made part of the record. Doesn't that sound to you a little bit off the wall? No, actually, I've not I've because never heard this was, that before. Well, this was oh, yeah. a motion to this. This appeal arises from the dismissal of counterclaims that were pleaded. The motion to dismiss that was made did not focus on the fact that it was oral. It focused on the fact that there was a waiver requirement in the earlier agreement. The justice uh, below. But if also we don't have this agreement, how could we possibly make a determination whether this agreement contained a provision allowing for lost profits without even having ever seen this alleged agreement? There's. We say exactly in our counterclaims. It's uh, on uh, page. The counterclaims are uh, listed on page. Uh, starting with uh, page 111 to 122 and it says specifically and i'll turn your uh to the exact page your honor paragraph 79 there it says exactly what it was and then uh it says what the representations were what the terms were do, do you say counsel that there is a a second written agreement in that counterclaim do you say anything like that I don't use the you word alluded to these oral conversations that occurred in uh, October of that year. No, we, we refer to an agreement in the second counterclaim. That's the breach. You say there's, a, sir, do you say that there's a written agreement? We did not say the word okay. written. We didn't okay. think it was in dispute. Okay. I don't okay. think it is in dispute. It was uh, signed by everybody. It's not in dispute. The question is whether this agreement reverts back to the first agreement. And this agreement is a totally different one. And the Primex case of the Court of Appeals says how you determine where a subsequent agreement is supposed to borrow from all the terms of a prior one. But, but, how, do we but how do we consider a second agreement that's not even uh, in the record? Uh, you know, so that's... It, it is yeah. alleged in the record. It is in the But it's not alleged. Your counterclaim doesn't allege it's a, separate, a written agreement. You, you, you make assertions with respect to what occurred at the meeting on, in October of 2018. That's it. No, we say that it was an agreement. That's in the second counterclaim. We you say it's a written agreement? agreement? Yes. Don't say written. Written. We don't say oral. We don't say written. We said it was an agreement. It wasn't do not written. say it's a written. You have a written signed agreement, correct? I have one, yes. You do not say that in your counterclaim. I did not say that in those words written or signed in the counterclaim, nor do I believe, uh, Justice Singh, we have to because the counterclaim alleges an agreement. It doesn't say anywhere in the CPLR that we have to attach an agreement or not. But counsel, this is Judge Gonzalez. You would agree that an oral agreement is treated very differently from a written agreement. Therefore, the distinction has to be made. Yes? Uh, actually, I don't think that in the context of this case where we were talking about totally different terms between the second and the first, it matters whether the second was oral or written because there was an agreement about what those terms were. 
And there's no dispute. The first one had a waiver clause. The second one did not. That is not in dispute. What okay, the any further questions from uh, the justices before we hear from respondent? Okay, let's hear from respondent. Good afternoon, judges. May it please the court. Uh, Bradley Polina for the plaintiff respondent, Rising Sun Construction, LLC. Uh, judging by the court's questions, uh, th there's not a whole lot more that I, I feel I need to say with respect to the uh, lost well, profit. Well, why did you respond to you? I'm sorry, go ahead. Judge well, we haven't talked about the fraudulent inducement claim yet. What um, would you like to say about Sienter? So what I'll say about Sienter is if we look at the if we look at the language, the pleading language in the in the fraud counterclaim, um, they're all statements of future intent. Uh, the allegations here are are certainly not allegations as to or, or concerning uh, present material facts collateral to any contract. Instead, uh, the allegations concern what Rising Sun allegedly said it would do under this agreement that was allegedly reached in October 2018. For example, the allegations are Rising Sun said it would perform its work expeditiously. It would place certain machinery on the project. It would place certain workers on the project site. Those are plainly statements of future intent. And the case law is very clear that when the only uh, allegedly fraudulent statements are a future intent to perform under a contract, the, the pleader has to allege facts as to Sienter and general allegations simply won't do. The trial court uh, dismissed this case, uh, dismissed that claim on, on that basis that the appellants came nowhere close to meeting their burden of, of, of alleging Sienter. There, there's just simply- well, would, it be, would it be also there. duplicative? Would it be duplicative of the breach of contract in any event? Uh, yes, Judge. The the trial court also correctly uh, held that the fraud claim is duplicative of the breach of contract claim because it's it's essentially based on the same facts and seeks the same damages as the portion of the breach of contract claim uh, that's that's not at issue on 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 this appeal. Uh, it, it really is just the breach of contract claim denominated as a fraud claim. How do, how do you how do you respond to your adversary's argument? The initial, the, the main the thrust of the argument that there was a separate October 2018 agreement, which is the operative governing agreement here. Uh, the, as the court is certainly aware, that the 2016 contract had a very clear mutual waiver of consequential damages. It said the contractor slash owner and subcontractor waive claims against each other for consequential damages arising out of or relating to this subcontract. Uh, the trial court looked at that and said, well, OK, let me just accept for purposes of deciding this motion to dismiss there was another contract. That doesn't really matter because the lost profit claims is still related to the 2016 subcontract because of concerned Rising Sun's work on this on the same project. It, it really is as simple as that. The lost profits counterclaim is squarely within the purview of the of the 2016 waiver provision. So the appellants come and, and continuously say, well, there's another contract. There's another contract. What they don't allege, not only do they not attach any contract to their opposition papers, they certainly don't allege anything that would suggest that the waiver provision in the 2016 contract was modified, altered, eliminated, that there's any reason that that provision uh, ceased to be effective. So the the even if there is another contract, that's really not the operative question. And it, uh, unless the court has uh, any other questions on, on either of the claims, we're, we're content to rest on our papers. Thank you very much. Let's hear from appellant. You have one minute. Thank you. I'd like to address uh, Justice Moulton's question about the fraudulent inducing claim. Of course, we are very well aware of the general principle that you cannot have uh, a fraud claim when uh, the allegation is the failure to perform in the future. Uh, the Deerfield case, which uh, is one of the uh, uh, foremost cases in the area, uh, held that at the time the promise was made, if the defendant had a, quote, preconceived and undisclosed intention of not performing the contract, that would be fraud. And the MBIA case says, if you use the same words in the breach of contract and in the fraud claim, that doesn't matter. 
the question, of course, always before the court is, how do you ever prove that someone did not have the president intention? So, so what are the facts well, here? And, what are and the facts? Here are the facts. Support. What are the facts? Yes. The facts that support it are as follows. That in October 2018, those representations were made, and the representation was made, you have to, by the plaintiff, you have to pay us a change order of $230,000. And then we'll enter into this con this new contract or whatever you want to call it. I'm not going to get into that issue right now. But we'll enter into that if, and we're making those representations about having staffing, et cetera, et cetera, if you pay that. And we paid that, and then there was no performance, and they left. There was no performance because they promised to perform within a month. And one thing is very clear. Thank you. No, that's enough. Is there any further questions from counsel? I mean, from the justices? Okay, thank you very much. Um, our last case today is Monroe Street versus City of New York. Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the court. My name is Israel Klein on behalf of the appellant Monroe Street. Your Honors, uh, Vehicle and Traffic Law Section 1111AD provides that technician certificates issued for red light camera violations must be sworn to or affirmed. The CPLR sections 2106 and 2309 are clear that they must be sworn to or affirmed before a notary. Why, counsel, does the CPLR apply to an administrative proceeding uh, which is brought into the VTO? Yes, Your Honor. CPLR section 101 is clear that the CPLR uh, applies to every proceeding, every judicial proceeding, every court before every judge. Well, this is not a judicial proceeding. It's an administrative proceeding. There was a challenge to a ticket. It's an administrative proceeding. Yes, Your Honor, but it's a proceeding before a court, and it applies to a proceeding before every court unless regulated by inconsistent statute. And Your, uh, Your Honor, the so it's before the it's before the administrative trial. But it's before oath. The office of administrative trial and hearings. That's not a court. I mean, it's an administrative body, but not a judicial court. Your Honor, it is the court. It's before a judge. It's before an administrative law judge um, in the Department of Finance, Your Honor. But it is a judge. And Your Honor, uh, people versus Counsel, Russo. What about the cases which hold, though, clearly that administrative proceedings are not a court and that that the, those rules don't apply to it? The CPLR does not apply to administrative proceedings. Your Honor, those cases that, are. I'm sorry. How do you get around that? Those cases are distinguishable, Your Honor. Uh, People versus Russo is clearly on point and states explicitly that the CPLR does apply to, uh, to uh, administrative proceedings involving traffic camera tickets. And in those cases, to the contrary, Your Honor, we're dealing with traffic tickets, not parking tickets. And there's a big distinction there, Your Honor, um, in that the traffic ticket statutes explicitly says that the CPLR does not apply in those instances. There's no such statute regarding parking violations and, and camera tickets, Your Honor. Um, and again, People versus Russo addressed this, addressed the Miller case, and stated explicitly that the CPLR does apply unless it's inconsistent with another statute. Um, although the legislature can um, write away the CPLR's applicability, if it doesn't do that, the CPLR does apply, Your Honor. Um, and in this instance, VTL 111AD is not inconsistent with the CPLR. It specifically states that the certificate must be sworn to or affirmed. It doesn't say- What about the long history, which is cited to in uh, in the city's papers of allowing these type of proceedings to go forward without having a, a notarized affidavit? Uh, that there's a long history in these type of proceedings. And that lends to support that that was the intention of the legislature under VTL you know, 1111 to continue to allow that. Yes, Your Honor, but again, there's a distinction between traffic infractions and camera violations, right? Traffic infractions are issued by police officers who are sworn to abide and uphold the law are in a position of trust. They're not camera technicians in a remote location viewing surveillance footage, um, Your Honor. Also, so, counsel, let me ask you a question. Even if, even if the, this should have been notarized, you have evidence, photographic evidence of the vehicle passing through a red light. Isn't that sufficient evidence to, to, to demonstrate that the, that the violation should be sustained? I mean, let's put aside, you're right. Okay, I'll, let, let me say I agree with you. It should be notarized. I don't think so, but let's say if I agree with you. There is evidence, there is photographic evidence of the vehicle passing through a steady red light. So how do we ignore that evidence? 
Yes, Your Honor. Again, the evidence needs to be submitted by the human being, right? The complainant cannot be a computer. So if you're throwing out the- Well, I don't know if you're looking at it these days, but a lot of things are done by computer. So are you going to say that this is our argument is invalid because we're doing it on computer and not in person? Well, Your Honor, I'm a person presenting the argument, right? I can't just drop off photographs on a desk and say, there's my evidence. There has to be a foundation. We don't know if they're accurate. And the judge is a neutral, independent party. There's no prosecutor here submitting the evidence. I'm not going to drop off um, a photographs on the desk of a judge and say, judge, make the case for me. That has to be submitted by a human being. And in this case, for the statute, it has to be notarized. If the, if the certificate is you not- You have an opportunity, I believe, if you get these kind of violations to challenge the photograph. Did you submit that? Did the person who received the summons submit that uh, argument before the administrative tribunal saying that I want to see the photographic evidence, I want to test the, the cameras? Did you ask for those type of discovery? Because you're, enti you're entitled to that. Well, Your Honor, the burden is not on the motorist to to make his case to defend itself. The burden is on the state. To Assuming that the photographs are accurate, then the burden shifts to your client to now demonstrate that the photograph or the photographic equipment is malfunctioning. Well, no, Your Honor, the statute is very clear with regard to the te te technician certificate that that is considered prima facie evidence. There's no such. I'm not. You're not. You're missing my point. My point is you have a right to challenge the efficiency or to challenge whether or not the mechanical devices are operating properly. I, I, I'm just saying that you could you can make that demand. You can demand that. You could make a demand for a complaint. You could demand that you want to see the, 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 the last time that the photographic machine was uh, was inspected. You can ask for all that information. Yes, Your Honor. Did um, you do my, that? No, Your Honor. But in my experience, in all of these cases, they're always denied. And again, that's not our burden. It's the state's burden. Well, to, it's a state's oh, burden. Okay. It's a state's burden to make its case, Your Honor. Follow the plain language of the statute, which specifically says that it requires a certificate sworn to or from by a technician. That's what the statute requires. Why shouldn't we enforce it as it is written? Yes, yes Your Honor. The, the plain <laughs> meaning of the statute, sworn to or affirmed, is sworn to or affirmed before a notary. Right. Every litigator knows, and every judge knows. But it doesn't the, say that. That's not what the statute says. You're adding words that don't exist. Well, Your Honor, well, to, to be fair, what um, the city wants to say, they want to add the words that affirmation is self-imposed. But Your Honor, VTL section 208 is very clear that an oath cannot be self-administered. And the statute gives the same way to oath and affirmation. So if an oath cannot be self-administered, then the plain meaning is that the same way is given to affirmation. It also cannot be self-administered. And Your okay. Honor, in people versus Sullivan- let's, let's hear from responding question, Pam, and then you'll have a chance to respond. Good afternoon. Mackenzie Fillo for the Municipal Cross Appellants. Um, substantial evidence supports the finding that the petitioner's car read a, uh, ran a red light. Your honors can see it for yourself at page 54 of the record. But, but, but counsel, let's just, let, if, if your adversary is correct, that the, that the uh, photo shouldn't come in, it doesn't go to the prima facie, then where's the substantial evidence? He's actually never said, I don't think anywhere in his brief that the photo shouldn't come in. He well, but said that, that would the, be, that's essentially the implication of the claim, right? That, 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 that they haven't been properly authenticated, they shouldn't come in, and, and the case should have been dismissed. Presumably that's the argument. So can you address counsel's VTL 208 argument? I'm not sure I understand his 208 argument. 208 specifically says that traffic infractions uh, administered by police, uh, issued by police officers uh, don't have to be notarized, that they can be affirmed under penalty of perjury. And that statute was enacted literally the exact same day that the sworn to or affirmed language was first used in the parking ticket statute in 1969. A whole bunch of stuff was done right around that same time that very clearly showed that the legislature was explicitly eliminating any notarization requirement in the context of these minor offenses that are adjudicated uh, now, at least in New York City, in administrative tribunals. Now, outside the city, some of these uh, tickets are still uh, administered in criminal courts. So in Ithaca, for example, if a police officer sees someone run a red light, they can issue a summons and a complaint in criminal court, and they can sign it without notarizing it under 208. The same thing applies to- the Is there a distinction here. between a police officer uh, who presumably has taken an oath and a, uh, and a technician? who's sitting behind some desk looking at a computer? Not at all. If if, if anything, the the certificate's um, statement here is arguably of very limited value. I mean, the court 
the ALJ can see for themselves the photos. It's hard to imagine a situation where the certificate said the, the photos show the guy running a red light and the photos themselves did not show that. Obviously, the ALJ is going to credit the photos, which she can see for herself. I mean, the, the photos are the heart of the case against the petitioner in these red light camera cases. The, the evidence couldn't be clearer. The idea that this is not substantial evidence is absurd. And I mean, the technician- that's, Counselor, this is Judge Arnold. That's exactly what I'm saying. Assuming arguing, though, that he's correct, what he's, that he's arguing that it should have been notarized, the bottom line is there's photographic evidence, there's videotape evidence yes. that anybody can see, that the, that, the, that, the, that the person who gets served with a notice of violation can see for themselves and challenge the video also at some yes, point. Yes, exactly. Uh, you know, the- I mean, everything is there. So, so assuming that it should have been notarized, you have a, you have other evidence that's substantial enough for the ALJ to arrive at a determination. Yes, that's exactly right. But I would also note that in the BM Nacho, B&M Nachos case that we said in our brief, this court held that an affirmation like the one at issue here was enough for the substantial evidence standard to support a liquor law violation. And so these kinds of certificates swearing or, or affirming under penalty of perjury is enough to meet the substantial evidence standard. Now, we also asked the court to say, to address the exact language, the sworn to or affirmed language, uh, because it is in so many statutes that the city deals with. And specifically, it's in the parking ticket statute. That's the first place that this language appeared in 1969. And the city issues 10 million parking tickets a year. So this decision, if it's left you know, unquestioned, uh, it could have serious consequences for the city. And in fact, the petitioner here and his counsel are challenging all of these statutes that use this exact same language. And we would like to nip this in the bud because the legislative history is so clear that this language was purposely chosen to eliminate the notarization requirement for these huge numbers of violations that are, for the vast majority of them, the petitioners do not contest their liability. And they are well placed to do so. And as one of your honors asked uh, my colleague here, uh, the petitioner here did not dispute ever that this was his car, that his car had been stolen. He did not ask for a hearing where he could call the the uh, technician to testify. You know, they if he makes a case for why he needs to do that, the ALJ can require that person's presence and compel testimony. He has waived all of that by just saying this very technical argument about this certificate needing to be signed in front of a notary, and that argument is wrong. I, ha- I think I'll save the rest for rebuttal if, if I'm, although I, I don't know, he, the, my colleague didn't address actually his, his appeal in his opening argument, which is about class certification. So I guess, should, I'm sorry for the confusion, but should I? Address any rebuttal if you want, but obviously okay. the more important issue is right is the merits. Yes, thank merits. you. Okay, so let's hear from uh, Helen. Yes, Your Honor. The legislative history and intent is not clear. I mean, there are specific um, uh, statutes regarding traffic infractions, which makes a distinction. It says that affirmations can be self-imposed. That does not apply here in parking violations. It's silent in parking violations. And Your Honor, if that was legislative intent, why would they write sworn to or affirm? If I can have an affirmation self-imposed, who's going to take an, an oath? Then just say affirms, you know, that's self-imposed. By saying an oath, it means because an oath. Otherwise, the legislator would have wrote uh, it's a, a technician certificate affirmed, you know, by them self on the penalty of perjury. They're writing oath because an oath and affirmation both must be before a notary public, Your Honor. Um, and People versus Sullivan, the Court of Appeals held that, that the plain meaning of oath or affirmation is that it must be for a notary. Um, so, Your Honor, to say that the legislative intent here is otherwise, and again, uh, taking into consideration the distinction between traffic infractions and camera violations, and again, Your Honor, a camera violation is, you know, remote. There's plenty of time to get that notarized. They're not out in the field where there's not a notary available. Um, so to say that the legislative intent here is that um, affirmation be self-imposed, Your Honor, I think is a stretch. Regardless, um, legislative intent should not be given any credence here because there is a plain meaning of the Thank you. Thank you. Your time is up. Uh, you have one minute to respond if you wish. I guess I would just briefly address the um, the class certification point, which is that 
which my colleague seems to have abandoned in his argument here. Uh, you can't have, even if this court agreed with him, which it doesn't seem like the court does, that you can't certify a class after a decision on the merits. This is one thing if the court like surprises a person and rules unexpectedly on the merits where the person didn't have a chance to move for class certification. But that's not what happened here. The the motion to dismiss where all of this was fully litigated on the merits was pending before the court for nine months. My colleague did not move for certif to certify the class during all that time. He lost the chance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this concludes oral arguments for today and the court is now adjourned.